Good morning. Good morning. Can you hear me okay? What's up? Okay. <laughs> Let me know, I can talk louder. <laughs> Reach out and touch. Our scripture today locates us in a story within a story. This is a story about the power of touch. Two women, one a young girl of 12 years old at the edge of death, and the other a grown woman who had been suffering in her body for 12 years, both from different situations economically and socially, but both in desperate need of healing, in need of a touch. The power of touch, to, to make physical contact, to have an effect on something or someone. Touch triggers action. Touch initiates change. Touch can lead to transformation. We can touch with our hands, we can touch with our words, our actions, our interactions. And I believe all the above is in our story today. Something happened when these women encountered a touch from Jesus. Something extraordinarily occurred, particularly for the woman with the issue of blood, who had the courage and the boldness to reach out and touch the garment of Jesus. Mark's version suggests that this unnamed woman was in a desperate situation that after having spent all she had, after constant doctor visits with no positive results, she needed something else. She needed another report. And when she first heard that Jesus was coming to town, she thought, and she imagined, that if she could just touch his clothes, his cloak, that she'd be healed. Let's look a little closer at this story. This story is about a woman who first heard. If you look at the scriptures preceding this particular story, Jesus just said, those who have ears to hear, hear, listen. She heard. Her ears were open. And she heard something that gave her hope. And after she heard, she thought or she imagined that if she could just make contact, not necessarily with Jesus, but just his garment, that her remedy would be found. And when she got close enough to him, scripture says she reached out and touched the cloak of his garment. This woman had enough of an imagination to see and believe that there was transformative power in a touch. Who was this woman? Well, it says she was a woman who suffered a lot, that she grew worse instead of better, that she probably came from means, but because she spent all her money on doctors, she was destitute. It doesn't say if she was married or if she had children, but if she was married, she would be left destitute by her husband, marginalized by others who, by Levitical law, would deem her as unclean. If she was married, she'd be unable to have relations with her husband or carry out any domestic duties for him or her family without making them too unclean. Everything she touched, furniture, utensils, um, and clothing, would be rendered unclean unable to touch children. Friends had to stay their distance. Sounds like this woman was alone. During this time, identity was connected to the community in which one was embedded. But she was isolated, alone, and without community. This woman's boldness to reach out and touch perhaps came from a place of desperation, despair. Or what else do I have to lose? already depleted economically, physically, emotionally, psychologically, and outcast socially and religiously? Why not? The impossibility of her situation and the immediacy of her cure underscores the power of Jesus that stands at the center of her story. That this woman initiated the interaction between she and Jesus is unique to this gospel story. She didn't ask permission. 
She didn't seek consultation or consensus from others. She remained in the crowd with her eyes focused on Jesus, forsaking purity laws, ignoring the shame that might be associated with her, and she pressed through the crowd until she could reach out and touch. Mark says she touched his clothes, his cloak. Matthew and Luke say she touched the edge of his cloak. Other versions say it was the hem or the border or the fringe of his garment. If you could pay attention to this slide, scripture takes us to Numbers 15. And it's referring to when Moses is telling the Israelites to make these tassels on the corner. He says, speak to the Israelites, Moses. Throughout the generations to come, you ought to make tassels on the corners of your garments with a cord on each tassel. And you will have these tassels to look at, and so you will remember all the commands of the Lord, that you may obey them and not prostitute yourselves by going after the lust of your own hearts and eyes. Then you will remember to obey all my commands and will be consecrated to your God. These are the tassels. And we'll refer to those in just a moment. But these are the tassels Moses is saying, is referring to. Some commentators suggest that it was this tassel, these tassels, that the woman was reaching out to touch. If you could show the next slide. It was common for Jewish males to wear what is called a talit, this, a prayer shawl. And it was worn during prayer services to prepare the mind and the heart for prayer and out of reverence for God. This talit had tassels, and they're called tzitzits. They're strings connected to the four corners of the shawl. And these teeth seats are fringes that contain eight threads and five knots, making a total of 613. This number corresponds to the 613 commandments contained in the Torah. These teeth seats represent the commandments of God or the word of God. Imagine with me that it wasn't so much that she was trying to touch Jesus that might have been a little bit too presumptuous. So she thought, she imagined, if she could just get to the hem, the edge, the board of the fringes, the tzitzit, the word, that would be enough. I don't know if this woman planned all this. I don't know how much notice she had of Jesus' appearance or arrival. Perhaps it was a snap decision just to go for it. Desperation, alienation, loneliness, abandonment, pain can set the stage for courageous and bold actions. It was a gamble, what she did, and it paid off. Her faith drove her to touch, and her touch was so powerful, so strong, so rooted in faith that Jesus immediately sensed power had left him. Well before he said, daughter, your faith has healed you, she was already healed. He was just echoing what had already occurred. Jesus didn't co-sign or give her permission to touch, let alone receive power from the touch. He simply responded to and affirmed her faith and her action. This woman went from being sick to well, from being empty to whole, from being unnamed to now being called daughter. In a culture that prized sons far more than daughters, it's notable that when these two stories are read in tandem, an equal value was given by Jesus to the life of daughter. And after the woman is discovered by Jesus, he says to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. And after he took Jairus' little girl by the hand, he says, little girl, daughter, get up. By calling them daughters, Jesus was, in essence, returning both of them to their communities, giving them status and position. And the woman, now called daughter, who was healed of the issue of blood, she goes off in wholeness and peace. No sooner does a messenger come from the house of Jairus with the only news of his daughter's death. And Jesus says, don't fear. Believe, and she will be healed. All this echoes what just happened with the hemorrhaging woman. What could and was about to happen for Jairus already happened for the woman. The 12-year-old girl just coming of age as woman 
is the same as that of the woman whose flow has not stopped for 12 years. Both were as good as dead. But Jesus brings wholeness and salvation to both. Whether this woman's issue was connected to menstruation or another disorder, probably vaginal or uterine, doesn't really matter. Jesus was shattering the legal purity system and its restrictive social conditioning. He was a healer who touched persons who were considered impure. In this culture, one was not supposed to come in contact or touch either of these two women. One had an issue of blood and the other lay dead. And Jesus defies all that and allows touch to facilitate their healing. And while the purposes of the Levitical laws were to ensure the holiness of the community, for Jesus, the purpose of the law was to facilitate access to God, not impede it. He was concerned with the wholeness and holiness of God's people, not the preservation of purity system for its own sake. There's so much more that we can discuss and explore with regard to what some Jewish scholars say about how us Christians have read into the purity laws and whether or not this woman was really clean or unclean. But for today's purposes, I think both camps would agree that the power of touch mixed with faith initiated transformation. This word touch appears four times in this story. These two main characters, this, the woman and the daughter, couldn't be more different from two different socioeconomic backgrounds. The little gir girl enjoyed 12 years of privilege as the daughter of the synagogue ruler Jairus, and the woman had suffered 12 years of destitution. The little girl had a male kinsman, a concerned father, who approached Jesus and pleaded her case. But the woman approached Jesus covertly speaking only to herself, and is apparently alone. But after the woman with the issue reached out and touched, she too received a male kinsman and is claimed as daughter. So not only did she receive healing, she received identity. And Jesus refused to allow her to remain invisible. He insists on knowing who she is. He wants personal contact and draws her into relationship. He protects her honor by affirming her bold action as an expression of deep faith. He removes her shame and accords her respect. And to go further, Jesus draws her out of hiding, urges her to find her voice, and gives her the opportunity to tell her story. Jesus does more than heal her. He empowers her. Touch caused all this. Isn't it interesting, the pairing of these two very different stories, these characters, these families? Isn't it interesting that it was necessary for the woman with the issue of blood, the one without voice, without status, without means, to be healed first? Jairus saw Jesus spoke first. He, sp he spoke up first. He pleaded his daughter's case first. My daughter's about to die. Come now. And while the hemorrhaging woman said nothing. Can you imagine being in the emergency room with your child, lying between life and death, when somebody shabbily dressed with an awful stench enters in after you who doesn't look sick or their situation doesn't seem as dire as yours, and they get seen first? Well, that's what kind of happened with Jairus. The woman seemed to cut in front, and she got seen and attended to first. You think in that moment that we're confessing words of faith or words of something else? Why would Jesus do this? What was so important that Jairus needed to be put on hold and have to wait? What was Jesus up to? Perhaps, perhaps Jesus wanted Jairus to grow in and speak words of faith. Perhaps Jesus needed Jairus to witness the faith of this bleeding woman, witness her healing before it was his turn for his miracle. See, Jesus knew the necessity of faith and the connection it has to one's healing. And Jairus wasn't demonstrating faith. So he needed more of it. So Jesus allowed time for Jairus to witness something that would encourage his faith, that would ultimately lead to the healing of his daughter. The woman had to be healed first. It was her healing that generated the faith 
for the privileged family of Jairus so that that daughter could be healed. I mentioned it before in another sermon that I had this Nigerian priest friend who I spent time with when I was in New Orleans. We'd walk and talk, and he'd always share with me these stories about miracles from his hometown, and I just got kind of frustrated. And I said, well, why don't I have any of those stories to share? He said, well, let me help you. He says, here, you know, you have the health system, you have physicians, you have medicine. You put your faith in those things. Back home, we're limited in these things, and all we have is faith. And that's all this woman had. Her faith initiated a chain of events for the household for Jairus, who had everything but faith. And their faith was elevated because of hers. Mark's gospel points out something unique from all the other synoptics, Luke and Matthew, that the women have a different role. They have a relationship with Jesus that depends on tactile means of communication, different from speaking or hearing. With the woman with the issue of blood, the silence stands out. There's no word spoken aloud in her healing. There's only touch. The narrative provides an image of a relationship which is both nonverbal and intimate, perceived internally by she and Jesus. Jesus is present to this woman with the flow of blood in a non-linguistic way for which the healing becomes the sign. And it's only after the healing that Jesus draws her into conversation. This story is also known by another commentator as a demand story, where the demanding party, in this case the woman, takes an active role in the struggle and overcomes. This story is very personal to me. Um, in the early planning stages, when we were reviewing the topics, I immediately gravitated towards this particular story of the hemorrhaging woman. I remember that I had very much identified with her when I first started growing in God and be interested in the Bible and trying to make these connections with life and scripture. And somewhere in there, I discovered that I had been that woman. I identify with her not because I was physically bleeding, but because I was spiritually depleted. I too had been looking for something or someone to fix me. I had been broken inside and really wasn't sure how to navigate life. It was during these years when my brother had died, and I realized I was running on fumes. That no amount of degrees or filling my time with friends or at the gym seemed to make me feel whole, safe, or content. I too had spent time and money, as well as exhausted my resources to find no real peace. And it wasn't until I grabbed hold of this new relationship with God that I was on a journey to wholeness. And it wasn't until I reached out and touched this word that I entered into fellowship, not just with God, but with one another. My life took on new meaning and new purpose. And looking back, I have come so much, so appreciative to embrace the love and the power that God has to turn situations that are unbearable and painful into on-ramps for wholeness and healthiness. And God did it for me through the loss of my brother, but he did it in another way, another way that I have never really talked about. You know, as a child, I was touched inappropriately by someone I trusted, and I didn't fully grasp the ramifications of these touches until well into my young adult years when I discovered that I had some mistrust toward men. I had issues with touch and all that came with it. I thought it was me, that I was incapable of entering into a healthy relationship with someone. And I wondered if I could ever be someone else's girlfriend or, or wife or, or mother. What was wrong with me that I wasn't like my other girlfriends who longed to be asked out, desiring a relationship that might end in marriage and a family. So at the time, I played along, not sure if I was pretending to be someone 
I thought others wanted me to be. And it wasn't until I shared my truth, until I shared what happened to me, that somebody else gave me permission to say it wasn't my fault. I didn't do anything wrong. And as I shared my truth and processed what happened, and still today process, what began to happen that I re was releasing the lie and the hurt and the shame and the pain and the perversion of it all. And I made room and space for God's love and God's touch. See, unbeknownst to me, what, what was happening, I had allowed that inappropriate touch to cause me to shut down. The touch just wasn't an option. No one was gonna ever handle me in an inappropriate way again. So I closed that part of me off to protect me from unwanted talk, touch. But at the same time, I was closing off myself to any potential healthy touch. And therein was the conflict. I couldn't have it both ways. I couldn't wonder why I'm not in a relationship when I dictated the terms and when in essence I had blocked anywhere, anyone from getting close, from touching or entering my heart. It's like putting a gate on your front door. Yeah, nobody can get in, but I can't get out either. So I was sort of stuck, I was in a cage. And if I had not dealt with this terrible topic, this inappropriate touch, I would have continued to keep up my barriers and walls to protect me from not just inappropriate touch, but I would never get to experience appropriate and healthy and a loving touch. When we put up walls, they seem like we're protecting ourselves, but they can also imprison us. And that's what this story did and does for me. That's the difference that God's word has made and continues to make in my life. This woman decided that she was no longer going to allow society to keep her hidden and in bondage. She heard, she imagined, and she reached out, and she touched. And when she touched, she was healed and restored. Each and every day, and no disrespect to the Jewish culture, by putting this prayer shawl on that is so holy and what it represents. But I think Jesus would be okay because it's bringing him glory. But each and every day, I desire to reach out and touch the presence of God, the hem, the edge, the cloak, the teeth seat. Whatever I can do to get into God's presence. Touching, touching this teeth seat, touching it, embracing it, not only allow me to be touched, but it allows me to touch others, tangibly and intangibly. Touching his teeth seat has allowed me to forgive my abuser and to forgive myself. People of God, it's only in touching this, the word, the presence that opens the door for us to receive a touch from the Holy One. If you've never done so, if you need to do it again, if, if you've never been touched, if you've been touched inappropriately, if you did the inappropriate touching, I challenge you and implore you, like the woman with the issue of blood, to be bold and courageous enough to reach out and touch. Reach out and touch one another. Reach out and touch the presence of God. And when we do, we position ourselves to receive the fullness and the wholeness and the salvation God has for us.